Make yourselves comfortable. It's my great pleasure this afternoon to uh, introduce Professor uh, Debbie Lucas uh, from the finance faculty here at MIT Sloan. As most people of our generation probably have this indelible impression of the last oh, decade as being cast by the uh, apparent collapse of the mortgage market in 2008. And as much has been written about that, uh, Professor Lucas has spent a substantial amount of her career investing in understanding the government role as it intervenes in varieties of financial markets. And she's here to solve all of these problems with a very simple formula, <laughs> which she promises to reveal right at the end of her 45-minute presentation. Welcome, Debbie Lucas. <laughs> Oh, great. Lots of people still coming in. Welcome back to MIT. This is great. Um, you're voluntarily coming back to class. And, uh, um, and even the weather is cooperating. So um, I really hope you have a wonderful few days while you're here. So I am going to talk to you about the US mortgage market. And in the way uh, that you'll remember from your classes, I packed in a whole lot in this talk. Um, I actually think, although um, I, maybe I want to leave a little time for questions at the end, if you have a burning question or comment along the way, I'd be happy to be interrupted because I think you know it'll be more interesting for everyone that way. But let me just jump right in and give you an overview of what I'm planning to talk about. Um, so I, I'm going to start at the beginning and tell you a bit about the origins of the US mortgage market because I think it's important to understand that history, to understand what happened and also what might happen in the future. Um, the US market is quite different than the rest of the world. And um, it's worth understanding what happens there um, a little bit in uh, thinking about what we might do better. Um, the bailout and its aftermath, as was just mentioned, is um, in, still in everyone's mind. Actually, a lot has changed, although there hasn't been any fundamental reform yet. And I want to talk a bit about that and then go on and um, get your thoughts on some of the leading reform proposals that are out there, which hopefully um, will be a more sensible way forward for this market that will avoid some of the problems of the past. So um, uh, I want to start by saying that the federal government has an enormous footprint in the US mortgage market. And it's had a very large footprint for a very long time. In fact, that history dates back to the Great Depression when the rate of um, people losing their houses was spectacular. You know, it, was a, it was a huge crisis for American society. We talk about the Great Recession um, and a lot of people losing their homes, but it was nothing like the Great Depression. And so out of that arose a real imperative to create institutions um, to make it possible for people to get mortgage credit in a way that wouldn't be as susceptible to economic up and down. So um, on this slide, I have a bunch of abbreviations that only those of you um, familiar with mortgage markets might know. But the federal home loan banks, the FHLBs, were created to funnel capital into the mortgage markets. And in fact, they still do. Today, they um, provide advances both to commercial banks, savings and loans. They're kind of an all-purpose government-backed entity which stay under the radar. And I'm going to leave them under the radar. I don't particularly love them, but we'll leave them alone. Um, the Federal Housing Administration, the FHA, um, was perhaps the main agency that came out of the Great Depression that was tasked with making sure there was a reasonable supply of mortgage credit. Um, one thing I have emphasized there is that they actually invented the 30-year fixed rate mortgage. So lest you think this was a private market innovation, it wasn't. It was a response to the fact that one of the reasons that people had lost their houses was that many of the mortgages were short term, and then they would have a balloon payment that came due. Well, during the, rep uh, during the Depression, the mortgages would come due, and banks wouldn't roll it over. So that was part of the process of people losing their homes. And so this idea that if you had a 30-year fixed rate, that would create um, much more stability, much more predictability, and that came out of FHA. OK, so Fannie Mae was also part of the government, actually part of FHA. Um, it was pulled out of the government 
for reasons that won't surprise any of you, basically budgetary. They wanted to get them off the books, so they privatized them. Um, they did keep a piece of um, what Fannie Mae was doing, and that's now called Ginny Mae. So Ginny Mae securitizes government guaranteed mortgages, whereas Fannie Mae, and then later its cousin Freddie Mac, um, came about to create liquidity um, in the non-explicitly guaranteed mortgage market. Okay, so anyway, that's the kind of, that's um, where we started. Um, where are we now? There's about $10 trillion of residential mortgages in the United States outstanding, and about 70% of those are securitized. That is, they're bundled into these mortgage-backed securities and sold to investors in a secondary market. Um, <clears throat> the rest of them are held primarily on bank balance sheets. Um, if you look at the graph below this and you look at the securitization volume and composition, this divides securitized mortgages um, between those that are backed by Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, or Ginnie Mae, basically the government, and the non-agency share which used to be called the private label market, so the private securities. So what you can see from this history is that the government-backed share actually dominated from way back. The, the graph goes back to 1995. As, as investor confidence in the housing market skyrocketed during the run-up in house prices, there was large growth in the private label market. A lot of private companies got into the mortgage securitization business. This is where you hear about maybe those mortgages weren't so good, maybe they shouldn't have been made in the first place, but in any case, um, private investors were willing to guarantee and buy them. Come the crash, the private label market disappeared, and it hasn't come back. And post-crash, basically the whole market, there it says 98%, is these government, are these government-backed um, mortgages. So the big question is, how do we, a capitalist society, move from having an almost entirely governmental mortgage market back to one where there is some private capital um, at risk? Okay, and so that's, that's kind of the big subject for today. Okay, okay. Um, um, I just, I know, well, how many of you, how many of you have uh, some finance background? Oh my God. Well, of course, you're Sloan graduates, you must. <laughs> That's great. So, um, so for those, I was, I was going to then bring it down to say, well, how many of you own a house? And then I was sure, or, or have a mortgage, and I thought everyone. But um, I'm, so I, I wanted to make it accessible. So this, some of this might be things you already know, but let me just quickly describe it. So I, you know, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about Fannie and Freddie. And I wanted to just throw in a slide so that we all knew exactly what happens in the market today. So these, these securitized mortgages that are about 70% of the mortgage market, um, the way it works is you go to your bank or you go to a mortgage broker, you go online to Quicken Loans, and you do reams of paperwork, and they say, okay, you're approved for a mortgage. And if that mortgage is a so-called conforming mortgage, it's eligible for purchase by Fannie and Freddie. That means you have the equivalent of 80% uh, no more than 80% loan to value. In any case, they buy those mortgages, they pool them together, they guarantee them against credit risk, and they create these mortgage-backed securities. Um, some of those mortgage-backed securities, in fact, most of them, they sell to private investors. So on those securities that they sell to private investors, all they're retaining is the credit risk. Um, there's other securities, though, that they themselves buy and hold in their portfolios. Those holdings of mortgages are financed with, with what are called agency securities. Um, in any case, at this point in time, um, the government effectively guarantees Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and I'll tell you uh, more about that, how that came about to begin with. Not only do they guarantee them, but they essentially run them. So they set the guarantee fees, they set policy, and so forth. So you, um, 
We're kind of, so even though it's hard to talk about Fannie and Freddie because they used to be private, now they're governmental, they're a bit in limbo, uh, but at least you should think of them now as being essentially governmental. Um, let, me, let me turn to some international comparisons. And um, I want to do this partly because when people talk about the US mortgage market and the importance of preserving the status quo, they often say things that aren't true, like the US has a higher rate of home ownership than other countries. Um, I don't know how well you can see this, but the United States, um, oh good, okay, the United States is right there. So what we have here is the home ownership rate. And you can see that on this axis of home ownership rate, the United States is really kind of in the middle of the pack. Um, Countries like Belgium or Spain or Portugal have higher home ownership rates. Countries that are developed that have lower rates, like Germany, have low rates because they like to have low rates. So there's something about Germans that makes them like to rent instead of buy. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> don't know. Don't know what, quite what that is. Um, anyway, this is plotting um, home ownership rates against the share of mortgage debt in GDP, and it's also showing that the United States doesn't necessarily support more mortgage debt to GDP than some other countries. The UK, for instance, has, has somewhat more. Um, all of this is to say that we don't necessarily get an extraordinary home ownership rate or the availability of mortgage financing out of our existing institutions. Um, what does distinguish us from the PAC, other than from Singapore, is that if you plot home ownership rates, against an index of government involvement in mortgage markets, whereas the United States, well, they're right here. So they're the highest, other than Singapore, in this dimension of government involvement or participation in the mortgage market. Okay. Um, I want to show you one more slide with international comparisons, and that has to do with the average initial fixed period of mortgages by countries. And here's another place where the United States is really an outlier, which is the average original maturity is over 25 years. So your typical US mortgage is, is um, a 30-year fixed rate prepayable mortgage. Um, so most countries have much shorter maturities. And um, the reason I want to emphasize that is that these other countries that have well-developed mortgage markets and high home ownership rates and less government involvement don't rely on 30-year fixed rate mortgages. And the reason I think it's so important for you to understand that is because I, along with a lot of people, think it's very hard to have a 30-year fixed rate mortgage in a very private market. I think it's just not a very good product. And I know that goes against the conventional wisdom, but I like to start by calling it an exotic financial derivative. And why is it an exotic financial derivative? Well, it's a long-term fixed nominal security, but to add insult to injury, it has this prepayment option that makes it very tricky to value, tricky to hedge, um, in fact, the people who take out those mortgages have trouble understanding it. Arguably, it's not as good for low-income households as higher-income households because more sophisticated households are good at knowing when to refinance, less so or less opportunity poor households. So it's, it's gotten markets in trouble many times. You can say it was certainly up there as the reason for the savings and loan crisis. You know, it's just, it's just a very risky security for investors, and anything that's risky for investors is risky for markets. So <laughs> um, I'm mentioning that partly because I think it's interesting to contemplate um, really moving away from the kind of market that we have today but the kinds of alternatives that I'm going to talk to you about are going to feel like maybe small perturbations on what we have now. And I guess the reason I'm choosing to do that is because I'm not sure that as a country or as a political system, 
we're really willing to give up on these 30-year fixed rate mortgages. So I think in terms of thinking about realistic solutions and where the market might go, it's good to remember that if we did move to a more radical departure from what we have now, there might be fewer 30-year fixed rate mortgages offered, which would be fine with me, but I don't think it would necessarily be fine with our elected representative. Okay, so let me um, kind of move forward to um, what happened, and you know what happened. Um, but to me, what happened very much starts and ends with the collapse of house prices. So this is a, a plot of real US house prices going back to 1980. Um, the peak is in about 2006, and then you have, of course, the subsequent crash that led to um, the financial crisis and the, the Great Recession. Um, something that's interesting in looking at this picture in real terms is you can see that actually house price appreciation was essentially zero from 1980 through the mid-90s. Um, then it did start to take off and it really accelerated in the 2000s. Um, along with that acceleration of house prices was an acceleration and the amount of residential mortgage debt that was used to purchase all of that. And um, of course, the other story of the financial crisis is that when house prices started to turn down, delinquency rates rose. Um, <clears throat> and I want to emphasize that it wasn't just a subprime crisis. What I have here is the top line are default rates over time going back from um, I guess 2005 to 2015. The top line is FHA. Um, those are the government-backed mortgages, which are essentially subprime mortgages. They can have as little as 3% um, down payments. Um, below that is Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Those are, were thought to be pretty safe conforming mortgages. But you can see that during the crisis, even those safe mortgages had default rates up around 5%. And because there's so many more conforming mortgages that defaulted, um, I actually think you should reconsider the narrative of it just being a subprime crisis. It was really a mortgage crisis, and it hit prime mortgages as well as subprime mortgages. Okay. Um, so it was, in fact, those lo losses on prime mortgages from high default rates that led to the collapse of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Okay, um, this is a sad picture, is the stock price history of Fannie Mae over this period. If I had gone back longer, it would have been a happy picture if, if you were a Fannie Mae shareholder. They had higher returns than almost any other company in the S&P 500 for a long time. They really were extraordinarily profitable. Um, that, that growth had slowed down uh, by the mid-2000s, and then, of course, it crashed um, in around 2008 when they were bailed out by the government. Um, something else that's interesting to note on this slide, well, there's several things, but one is that they're not dead yet. <laughs> um, you can see there's still a little, <laughs> if this were an intensive care unit, um, you can see a tiny bit of life in <laughs> uh, Fannie and Freddie even recently. Um, and that, who knows what that is? What are, what are, what's the deal there? This is their common stock. Anyone? No. This is their, so there's all these lawsuits that you must read about periodically in the Wall Street Journal. Um, when, when the government took them over, they put them into conservatorship, not receivership. So the legal distinction, I guess, is had they put them into receivership, and they still have the right to do that, but they haven't, receivership would have wiped out the claims of the common stockholders. But conservatorship is this kind of weird legal status, and I'm not a lawyer, so I can't tell you the details, but what it does is it gives them hope that they could somehow, again, have a claim on some of the assets of Fannie and Freddie. So there are still, um, so I would say this is, the value in the stock is a bet that some court somewhere is gonna rule on behalf of the stockholders. So far, no courts have ruled on behalf of the stockholders. Um, what's still true of their securities is that they're still rated AAA just, uh, despite the fact that their stock is worth nothing. And that's because of um, the legislation that basically said that the US Treasury was going to support Fannie and Freddie 
through something called senior preferred stock purchase agreements. Okay, so there was this big piece of legislation in 2008, the Housing and Economic Recovery Act. As I mentioned, it put them into federal conservatorship that basically transferred control to their regulator and to the treasury. Um, the deal with these preferred stock purchase agreements is that whenever they need money, as they did very badly in 2008, the treasury purchases senior preferred stock and that provides capital to the GSEs. Um, so um, basically in 2008 and a little bit thereafter, um, they drew about 250 billion on those lines um, and those total lines from the treasury are capped at 455 billion. Um, I'm mentioning that because in some sense that makes this guarantee a potentially exploding time bomb. Um, because what's happening today is that all of the profits of Fannie and Freddie are just swept right into the treasury. So their equity is essentially kept at zero, but were they to experience losses, they'd get further draws on these treasury lines. So eventually they would probably be drawn down to zero. But before you panic and call your broker, um, there's no imminent chance that they could blow through the rest of their lines unless there was another big crisis. So, you know, it's a pretty, it's pretty secure. Um, I also want to mention that uh, with regard to these lawsuits, um, originally the Treasury was receiving a 10% dividend on these preferred stocks that they had purchased. Um, the problem with that 10% dividend is that Fannie and Freddie were not profitable enough to pay the 10% dividend. And so what was happening is Treasury was paying money into Fannie and Freddie in order for Fannie and Freddie to turn around and pay um, a dividend to the investor, uh, you know, it was kind of a dividend to um, Treasury, and that was drawing down on these lines. And that's when they had this Third Amendment, which created this sweep. Okay, so that's, that was kind of the, um, the, the origin of that. Okay, um, the, the law also did a few things that those of us who have been critical of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac for a long time, um, thought were good in terms of reducing risk. And the first of those is to reduce that retained mortgage portfolio. So I mentioned to you that they guarantee MBS, but they also hold MBS on their balance sheet. And historically, people actually believed that it was their balance sheets that would blow up because they didn't adequately hedge interest rate risk and prepayment risk, not that they would ever have a credit risk event. I, I, you know, I've worked on these guys for decades, and I would sometimes mention credit risk and basically be laughed out of the room. So there was really no anticipation that credit risk would be what brought them down. Everyone thought it would be um, these other kinds of risks, and by reducing their balance sheet, they have much less exposure going forward to these other kinds of risk. Um, the other thing that they did, and since many of you are in finance, I, I hope you find this interesting, is they created these, um, they, were, they were told they had to start sharing some credit risk with the private sector, uh, which is also, I think, a good idea. And so they created these new securities. Um, Freddie created stackers, Fannie created kinetic, Connecticut Avenue securities or these cast securities. And I just want to tell you a little bit about them. I've been looking at them recently and um, I think they're actually at the moment kind of uh, a very, um, very interesting security for people to think about buying. Okay, um, how am I doing on time? Okay, uh, I want to go through this. I'll try to go through this part very quickly. I couldn't help but leave it in. So I have to say that this slide about valuing the GSE's government support is the piece that's really the most reflective of my own research, not just on the GSE's, but on government financial institutions more broadly. Um, so in this particular, I'll tell you about that in a second, but in this, in this particular set of questions, all have to do with the question of how much does all of this cost taxpayers? It's a question where surprisingly few people, basically me, um, try to figure out what the answer is. Um, so so the, the questions go along the lines of what did that bailout actually cost? Has that been recovered through these payments back to Treasury? Um, there's still this Treasury guarantee going forward. What's the value of that? 
Um, and then if Fannie and Freddie were privatized, and there's been some conversation about doing that, would that cost money for taxpayers? Would it make money for taxpayers? What's reasonable to expect? And then there's this whole question about um, the current amount that borrowers are paying on their mortgages. Those rates are being set by policy, not by markets. So it's natural to ask how subsidized are these mortgages currently. Um, so th this is getting to kind of the, the broader research agenda is um, Governments are the world's largest financial institutions. If any of you have heard me talk before, you always hear me say that. You know, it's not Citi, it's not Bank of America, it's not Deutsche Bank, it's governments. They are big financial um, actors. And this is one of those cases where they're dominant in the second largest fixed income market in the United States, the first being treasury bonds, so the government is also there. Um, so any of these reform proposals would actually involve massive transfers of risk and resources between the public and private sectors, both balance sheet assets, and then more importantly, these kind of explicit and implicit guarantees on the credit risk. So we need to have some estimates of what these things are worth. Um, it's a little challenging. Thank goodness we had Bob Merton to teach us about valuing contingent claims and the fact that risky debt is like a put option because really all my work is just piggybacking on Bob Merton's famous ideas in that, in that area. So um, I won't show you any options pricing formulas here. Um, <laughs> but um, but there's also some, when you're doing public policy, it's not rocket science, but it is quite frustrating because even the meaning of what cost is, um, is not clear. You know, it's, it's complicated. Okay, so if you read the popular press, you would conclude that in fact, the public has recovered the value of the bailout of Fannie and Freddie because if you just add up money coming in and money going out, more money has come back to the treasury than has gone in. Um, but that's naive for two reasons. One is there's no risk adjustment, no discounting. You would have flunked your first finance class. Um, so, you know, that's, that's a problem. But, but, but a more fundamental problem is that you can never think about cost on that kind of a forward-looking cash basis because cost is an ex-ante idea. It's a question of how much was the insurance provided by the government worth at the time it was granted. Now, and the reason that's important is because we only saw one outcome, and thank goodness it was a good outcome. Markets basically recovered over the next um, decade or so, and I'm happy they recovered, but unfortunately it just reinforces bad habits of thought because it makes people think there wasn't really a cost when the cost should have been at the time um, when it happened, and so um, actually um, I like the number for cost. If you want to think about at the point of the bailout, if you look at the value of the support at that point that was granted, um, CBO estimated on a fair value basis that was about $291 billion. Full disclosure, I was working at CBO then, so I'm <laughs> so CBO and me agree that <laughs> that this that this was a good number, um, and so by that kind of a measure, which is taking into account both risk adjustment and the bad outcomes that could have happened, um, they're not close to having really recovered the full cost of the bailout. Okay. Um, in terms of the value of, federal, of the backstop going forward, um, if you do a kind of a fancy contingent claim analysis. Um, I come to the conclusion that actually the sweep of money that's going to the Treasury more or less covers the insurance value of what they're providing now, so there's not a lot of excess value um, being generated. So if we think about um, privatization and whether it would cost money for taxpayers or make money for taxpayers, um, I think that basically there's not a lot of value there unless the government, along with the privatization, reinstitutes underpriced guarantees or reinstitutes the kind of duopoly power that Fannie and Freddie had before the crisis. You know, I, I don't think their systems are worth too much by all accounts. Their, their computer systems are aging. Um, their current pricing 
my analysis showed wasn't making a lot of money. Um, so I don't think there's, I think it would be wrong to anticipate that this is going to be a bonanza for taxpayers, but of course privatization could have a lot of indirect benefits that are very valuable, um, greater transparency, more equitable pricing, more innovation in mortgage finance and, and so forth. Um, as far as how subsidized Fannie and Freddie guarantee fees are today, that's a question I'm working on now. I'll say I don't know the answer. Um, one thing that is helping me think about the answer, though, are these new securities that I said I would tell you a little bit about um, that have some credit risk transfer going back to the markets. Um, the stacker securities were pleased to be the best RMBS deal of the year in 2015. In fact, these things are really ramping up. So they were very, um, they tiptoed into the market of sharing credit risk, um, but now it's really moving to a larger scale, which is part of the reason I wanted to tell you a little bit about it. Um, in terms of who are buying these securities, it's mostly asset managers and hedge funds. My guess is that hedge funds are buying the riskier pieces and the asset managers are buying the safer pieces. There was a, was there a hand? Yes. yes. Could you please clarify what you mean by share credit risk? Oh yes, I'm sorry. So when, uh, <laughs> thank you for bringing me down to earth. Um, when when um, a mortgage defaults right now, Fannie and Freddie take that loss, rather the investors who um, provide the money for the mortgage. They get guarantee fees. So uh, if those guarantee fees are set reasonably, they're pretty much gonna balance out those losses. But all that risk is going to Fannie and Freddie and then the government is guaranteeing Fannie and Freddie, so if those guarantee fees turn out to be not enough, the government will take the losses. And this is saying, let's bring some private capital in to absorb some of that risk in return for some rate of return. So um, how are they doing that? Well, um, they're creating financial derivatives, but that's okay. So what they're doing is they're taking a pool of risky mortgages as a reference pool, that's the green box over there, and then um, they're issuing securities, actually floating rate notes, um, where those, let me just jump to the next slide, those different notes that they're issuing have a floating rate, LIBOR is a floating rate, and then some spread. And um, the spreads on some of them, if you go to the bottom, the B, the spread is 9.2%. Okay, so why are they paying LIBOR plus 9.2% on those B securities? Well, they're paying that much because these things are structured to absorb the default losses um, from this pool of reference mortgages. So that class B note has is in a first loss position, and it takes losses of up to 1% of the value of the reference pool, then the next class of securities starts absorbing losses of those losses accumulate between 1% and 2.25% and so forth. So as you go up in that class structure, you get to safer and safer places. Um, Fannie, uh, Freddie Mac keeps the class AH tranche. So the mortgages in this particular example are about $32 um, billion worth of mortgages. Um, but you can see the B class is only 318 million. So they're just at that first loss position. Okay. Um, so the idea here is that these securities get a high rate of return, um, but, but they're taking a bunch of credit risk. And when um, Fannie and Freddie do the analysis of what would have happened during the crisis had these securities been out there, um, they show that in fact, um, all the losses that they took would have in principle been absorbed by those B-class securities and then some of the lower mezzanine securities. So they're claiming that there's a meaningful amount of credit risk transfer um, in these securities. Okay, um, just, um, yeah, I wanna move forward. Okay, um, so their goal now is to transfer quite a lot of risk on 30-year fixed rate mortgages, which is most of what they're, they're buying. Um, I, I think I don't wanna get into this too much, but <laughs> I, I guess by way of saying um, it's interesting from an investment perspective, in traditional Fannie and Freddie manner, they're saying um, one thing to the government and one thing to investors. Um, what they're saying to investors are, 
um, these things are a pretty good deal. And what they're saying to the government is we're transferring a lot of risk. And so, you know, which, which, <laughs> which is it? So I was, I was trying to look into that. And I would say, I think it's probably true that they're not transferring as much risk as they say they're transferring, which is why I think these might be um, still a pretty attractive um, purchase for investors. Um, so first of all, they pull out the riskiest loans. They pull out loans that have, they season a little bit, so they pull out the ones that have already defaulted and so forth. So there's, there's a bunch of exclusions that pull out some of the riskier loans. Yeah, questions? Now that they're doing so much of the transfer, are, are we saying the G fees are gonna drop or, or is that a question still up for debate? Um, that's a great question and in fact, Okay, so here's what, okay, I, I love that question. The question, oh, sorry, there was supposed to be a microphone there. The sorry, question it, was, um, well, now that they're doing this risk transfer, will it cause the G fees to fall? My answer is, I think au contraire, because right now the G fees are set by policy. And the tension always is there's, there's a lot of political pressure to keep rates low. So at least for their riskier mortgages, um, I would believe that they're underpricing risk. My, my belief that they're underpricing risk is also because essentially no private actors have stepped into the market to compete with them at the current pricing. So at least there isn't a lot of money lying on the table right now. What's really interesting, though, is that these securities give you a lens into how the private market is pricing mortgage risk. And so, um, and they're having to pay investors these quite high fees for these things. So the, these are actually potentially making Fannie and Freddie themselves less profitable because they have to make these payments to investors and they do eventually put some pressure on the G fees. It's also a good signal because in terms of privatizing the market, regulators are afraid that mortgage rates will go up if they privatize. And this gives you some signal as to what the market would actually charge. So that's good too. Thank you. Was there, did I see, miss another question back there? Okay. Um, we just, okay. Okay, um, so also if, if you guys are into this and you simulate out prepayment and amortization and everything, it seems like these securities amortize in a way that probably pulls them out from some of the risk too. So the bottom line of my uh, very quick analysis is um, there's about 16 basis points of risk priced by the market here, but only about nine basis points of that maybe is sold to the market. So. Um, I think they're still retaining a lot of risk. But more fundamentally and more problematically, um, there's a question of whether this kind of structure would work in a serious market downturn. Um, so if you go back to the structure that I just showed you here, um, had I been talking to you in 2006, I could have been essentially describing to you a private label mortgage-backed security. You know, these toxic things. And, and what are these things rated? Well, that, that M1 class is rated AA. You know, so we're back in a situation where we've created securities that are supposed to be taking credit risk, yet somehow miraculously get a AA rating because of this subordination structure. So um, this is actually a point that um, Paul Willen make, made, who works at the Federal Reserve um, Bank of Boston. I think he's right. So um, he, he, the way he puts it is, will stackers be the CDOs of the next crisis? You know, are we going to have people who are really surprised by the losses that they take here. But I think just in terms, so I, I, I'm, and I partly went into all this detail to say that even though they've created, kind of reluctantly created some structures for sharing risk, I don't think they're that robust. And I think that speaks to the need for having some real fundamental reform if there is a desire to bring private capital um, back into the market. Um, so that was the graph I showed you before. So I just wanted to remind you that what's happening now is that you take out a mortgage, it gets pooled by Fannie and Freddie, who um, essentially have none of their own capital, so the capital is the government's, and then they um, are selling the securities. Um, <clears throat> so here's another quiz question for you. What did Dodd-Frank do about ground zero of the crisis, which was the mortgage market? What did Dodd-Frank, what title in Dodd-Frank did anything about uh, mortgages, really? 
Yeah, essentially none. So it, it basically said, well, we're going you know, to fix what the problems of the crisis, but it didn't even address the kind of the ground zero of the crisis. The one thing they said is you have to write a you, treasury, you need to do a study on what the options are. So this is, this is the one result of um, Dodd-Frank to the mortgage market, which is to ask treasury to lay out some options. And, I, and they did a very nice job of it. And so I just was, um, by way of introducing um, the possibilities, this is kind of the gamut from moving to a system that's actually more governmental, where at least certain mortgages qualify for some government guarantees of the credit, um, all the way through to a fully private system where the government is basically out of the mortgage guarantee system. Um, both of those endpoints seem relatively unlikely. Um, I think it's clear that uh, Congress is, at least at this point, isn't going to go for creating a new government agency to take a lot of um, credit risk. Um, there's probably more interest in a fully private system. Um, I think there, even for people who are sympathetic to that idea, and I have quite a bit of sympathy for that, I'm not sure it's feasible just because the housing market is systemic to the economy. It would be very hard for the government to let the mortgage market crash in any event. So it's more a question of whether you want to set up a system where the government is prepared to step in versus one where um, there's no formal way for them to step in, but it would be kind of an ad hoc response once they did. Um, so anyway, I, I, well, I'm, I sound editorial, I want to sound less editorial, but I think what's more likely is that something like Treasury, what's called Treasury Option 3 with a secondary guarantee um, is what we would wind up seeing. Um, there's a whole class of proposals that are out there. I think the policy wonk community is pretty much um, debating which version of Treasury 3 would make the most sense. Um, Treasury 2 is a variant of Treasury 3, and I'm running out of time, so I'm not even going to um, talk about that. So let me show you um, one of these Treasury 2 kinds of proposals. Um, there's, a, there's a legislation, Johnson Crapo has this flavor. Um, uh, there's actually proposals on the left and the right that have something of this flavor. So this is like the chart I showed you earlier where you go and you get your mortgage from a mortgage broker. And um, what we've done now is we've replaced Fannie and Freddie with possibly a successor to Fannie, a successor to Freddie, but not necessarily. We can have private companies coming into the market, could be um, commercial banks, investment banks. But anyway, all of those entities that were securitizing these mortgages that ultimately had some catastrophic government backing would have a minimum capital requirement to put towards this business. So you would be having the capital of those institutions absorbing the credit risk. Okay. And the point of having a whole bunch of them is that instead of having a duopoly as we've had in the past, there would be healthy competition between them um, to try to push value out to the ultimate borrowers. Um, so another, so a feature of the system, though, is that the government still would have a role in picking up the catastrophic risk. So in the unlikely event, if they were sufficiently capitalized, um, that you ran through that capital and they couldn't cover the guarantees, the government would step in and they would make the MBS investors whole against credit risk. Um, but unlike how it is now, there would be an explicit fee for that, and the guarantee also would be explicit. Um, another issue floating around what's true now and what might be true in the future that I haven't talked about at all, but it's on a lot of people's minds, has to do with affordable housing goals and how you achieve them. Um, so again, let me say something about other, other countries relative to the United States. In most other countries, Housing subsidies are only to the rental market. Um, but in the United States, there's been a lot of support for trying to bring everyone into home ownership. And so there's these subsidies um, in the mortgage market. Um, the FHA uh, makes those kinds of guarantees. And those guarantees are on budget. They're part of the government. But on top of that, 
there were also pressures on Fannie and Freddie to, to make housing affordable. And everyone always felt that was a weird tension between having to be safe and having to serve their shareholders and yet um, providing these subsidies that were outside of the budgetary system. So I think everyone pretty much agrees that this kind of a structure is really meant for the conforming mortgage market, that kind of middle class mortgage market, and that you can have housing subsidies, but they should be put somewhere else explicitly in the government. So it also tends to do that. Okay, so um, I was kind of ran through that kind of quickly, but you can see that this is not too big a, a change from the current system, yet it addresses some of the really serious weaknesses Pricing would be free for these companies. So these guarantee fees would reflect the market cost of risk. The government really would be put into a catastrophic loss position, so there wouldn't be um, as big a government role. And um, so, so it is definitely a step in the direction that, that people would like to see. Um, despite the fact that I think that it addresses some of the most serious shortcomings of the current system, and it has quite a bit of buy-in because it doesn't radically change it. Um, it gets criticized both from the right and the left. Um, on the, this is just a microcosm of everything else you see in Washington these days. In, um, from the right, uh, there's people who just don't want to see a government role. They want the government out. So for instance, Hens uh, Representative Henserling has a proposal that basically gets the government out of the market. Um, they're also worried that the government insurance will continue to be underpriced. On the left, um, there's a lot of pushback against taking government control out of the mortgage market. They think it would be anti-housing because there'd be a good chance, as per the question earlier, that mortgage rates would go up. Um, there's also a lot of suspicion, unfortunately, or fortunately, who knows. But anyway, there's suspicion still of Wall Street, um, the idea that you would let them back into the market. They're worried that it would just create another situation where they'd get bailed out again in the future. So I don't think um, that anything is going to change too quickly, but, uh, but optimistically, I do think that there's some pretty good plans out there. So if, if things change and it becomes possible, I think I think it could be a lot better. Larry. Which of the changes are subject to shareholder approval as opposed to legislation change? Okay. Um, the question was, which of the changes are subject to shareholder approval rather than legislative changes? My understanding is, at this moment, shareholders have zero control. Um, some changes can be made administratively. So the regulator of Fannie and Freddie is FHFA. They basically call the shots. They can do, they can do a lot of things. They've done things like control how fast these new securities have come onto the market and so forth. The government is deciding what's happening right now, but it would take legislation to make a major change. Yes. Under the FDIC system, banks pay a fee to FDIC for the insurance, and the insurance is limited to something like $100,000, or so maybe it's a bit more now. Could we learn something from that and use that in the mortgage market? Yeah, I would say that the proposal I showed you is very FDIC-like. Um, so let me tell you why that's true. So the banks have capital requirements, and the reason they have capital requirements is in part to protect the FDIC from taking losses. And so what we have with the banks is we have a guarantor of last resort, but capital is supposed to absorb losses first. Okay, this, this proposal here makes the government basically an FDIC for the mortgage market because the first loss position would again be these private companies, their capital would be backing it, there would be a fee like FDIC insurance. So it would have that similarity. How much mortgage would be insured? Pardon? There's a limit in the FDIC case of... Supply. Yes, oh, okay, thank you very much. So um, I didn't say it, but conforming mortgages are limited. So a conforming mortgage, in fact, can only be um, so big, but that so big is very big. So there's also, 
uh, there's a lot of moving pieces here that I didn't have time to talk about, but certainly um, one idea is to reduce the cap on a conforming mortgage. So now they go to, I think, 617 or something, 617,000, which if you live in New York City, um, doesn't help you very much, but if you live in Iowa, it's you know three times the average price of a house there. So there would be ways of adjusting the mortgage, the conforming um, limit that would also reduce the role of the government, and that you know that certainly would be a way to limit the effect of of this. Yes. It's very complex. <laughs> yes, it's uh, very complex, and I'm looking at the Canadian markets. It's socialistic approach, it's less complex. If I, if I put myself into this populist following Trump, when I look at all these things, it's like a very complex, it's unnecessarily complicated by the elitist try to figure out confusing everybody. <laughs> what are your th thoughts on that? Is, why, what, is it fundamental issues being addressed with this approach or proposal? Um, so the question is, um, is this kind of complexity a good idea or necessary. And I, I said that um, other countries did things differently. I didn't say how. So let me say how they do it and compare it to that. So in a lot of um, European countries, mortgages are held by banks, but they're funded by these things called covered bonds. Covered bonds are a bit like securitizations because the funding is tied to the mortgages. So the banks, in a sense, are these insurers. They take the credit risk. And they're still getting liquid funding in the markets from these covered bonds. I personally think I prefer that system. Um, for a reason that isn't because I'm an economist, but just watching the world, which is I think the problem with the US system is that by putting housing finance outside of the rest of the world of finance, you create a lightning rod for political manipula manipulation. So even if we say today we're going to move away from having a government market, if you create some entity where all the housing finance is going through that, it's just so easy to step back and put in all kinds of rules and weird complexity. Um, I know that's not exactly what you're, you're asking, but I think we do have a system that's unusually susceptible to kind of manipulation. I think in the European system, certainly Europeans support their banks. They bail them out every few years. So I'm not at all saying, <laughs> I'm not suggesting that the rest of the world is so great, but I think that if you put housing finance and diversified it with other things. You, what you really asked me is, does this justify the anger <laughs> of Trump people? And I just can't see it. So I'm not going to say that the Trump people are right because the mortgage market is complicated. <laughs> uh, yes. yes. Professor, could you share your view on interest rates on mortgages and stuff? I'm just curious, when do you see it going up to 10%, 12%, and especially with all this uh, risk and how you're diversifying it? Um, no, I don't see it going up at all. And I think, in fact, that the concern that rates would go way up if the market were privatized is not a valid one. So one clue that you get on what might happen to rates in a private market is to look at the rates on non-conforming mortgages, particularly jumbo mortgages, which are above the conforming limits. And if you look at the spreads between those jumbo mortgages and the conforming mortgages, it's not that much. It's maybe 50 basis points or something. So it's not, you know, it's not 10%. So basically mortgage rates are going to track the yield curve and then there'll be some spread, but they're not that big. And intuitively the reason they're not that big, at least on the credit side, is default risk just isn't that big. If you, if you look at the numbers I showed you about these kind of normal default rates on conforming mortgages, it's less than 2%. And, and you know, mortgages, what's ironic about having such a big government involvement in mortgages is mortgages have to be your favorite asset for what you should be able to borrow against in a free market. You know, they're, they're collateral. They don't have feet 
they don't go anywhere. So, you know, if, 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 a, if a market is ever going to work, it should probably be a mortgage market. And those, the spread shouldn't be that high. There isn't that much risk. There is also some spread, though, because of this prepayment option. So we're all paying for the prepayment option because it's priced into, priced into the mortgages. But that's also not that much money if you price it out. Oh, sorry, there was a question over here. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you for walking us through all this stuff. Um, I just have a quick question. Um, so recently I read that Fannie Mae kind of, you know, um, they, they were going to in their desktop underwriter system. They kind of wanted to expand the debt to income ratio up to 50% and without, you know, requiring other compensating credit factors. I think this is very likely to introduce non-linear credit factors going forward. So I'm curious, like, what's the reason behind this change? And uh, did they learn nothing from the crisis? <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's a great example of my fear when you have the government controlling the guarantee fees without any reference to market prices. So they do have some risk adjustment in the fees, but in the way of governments, it's not complete risk adjustment. So there's some cross subsidization between uh, the different groups of borrowers. So if you're pretty safe, you're probably paying too much. And if you're risky, you're getting a bit of a subsidy. And they are pushing to liberalize. Um, but let me give the other side of it to be fair. So if you talk to um, someone like Lori Goodman, who's uh, from, Am she was at Amherst Securities, now she's at the Urban Institute, she would argue that actually the, the G fees, the guarantee fees right now on average are too high. She would, her analysis says these prices are high, the more, as, as you saw, the risk has gone way down, um, that really, um, there is room to take more risk. And, and there is some evidence of that. Like if you look at the trend in the FICO scores of people who are getting mortgages, they've been going up significantly. And so it ha there is, I think, a valid argument too that it has become actually quite hard for people who don't have squeaky clean credit or don't have a conforming property to get a mortgage at all. I mean, to me, actually, what's, what's actually quite sad about having a government dominated market is it's a much more rule bound market. So if you're poor and you can get an FHA mortgage, that's great. But if you can't right now, there's no other alternatives. So I mean, I guess you can look at it either way. So some people think, well, they should loosen the rules. And that's what you're seeing in the, that particular rule change that you're looking at. Okay. Oh, there's that. Yes, th thank you very much. Very interesting discussion so far. Um, so can you elaborate a bit more about this definition of uh, conforming versus non-conforming? And to follow your example, uh, in some geographies, this is three, the upper limit is three times the average median house price. And in some places like New York, it's not enough. So who determines what's actually conforming? Who sets the definition of conforming? Um, so. Um, the government, <laughs> um, but there's some of it is by statute and some of it, it has some policy flexibility, but let me say what it is. So the main the full on, full on comment, Sorry, should it be, shouldn't it be a function of the average median price price point in the area, as opposed to just some arbitrary set governmental number? So it probably should be, but it isn't. Um, there is, some, there is some regional variation. So in fact, in, during the crisis, they increased the limit in some high cost areas, but the, the slope of the limit increases is less than the slope of the property value increases. Um, there's actually, I think, more variation in the FHA guarantees, which is linked to the median house price in, in an area, but this is pretty flat. But um, the question was, what is the definition of a conforming mortgage? So to me, the most important thing about a conforming mortgage is that you need a 20% down payment or private mortgage insurance where you're paying someone else to take that, that credit risk. And that's why when you looked at those default rates, they're typically not very high because you have this 20% buffer. So it really takes something like what happened where you had house prices falling 30, 40% um, to, to have significant credit risk. And that's why people traditionally weren't so worried about 
credit risk. There's, but then there's this cap, which is the maximum um, amount you can borrow in a conforming mortgage. And the idea there was to keep the support for the middle class. But in a place, uh, in many places in the United States, um, houses are still $150,000. So you certainly don't, you know, so they could use to change those, change those rules. And yeah. This will be our last question. Okay. Are you or would you be interested in looking at the eventual relationship, because it just came up in the question of the debt ratio to assumption of how much you can carry. The Washington way, I would predict, is that we'll get an exclusion for student loan debt interest rates in calculating that ratio, because they'll just create that waiver and all hell will break loose. But the next crisis outside the mortgage industry is going to be in the student loan area. And that's an area where no one is looking at the correlation between when that happens and any eventual solution on the mortgage side. Yeah, actually people are looking at student loans, including me. Um, <laughs> and I, in some ways, it, it's gonna be a different kind of crisis because student loans um, are largely, or almost all, almost all the risk is in the government, so it's not gonna bring down the private financial system, and that's the big difference. So um, if the question is, is the government likely to lose a lot of money? Um, I think the answer is yes. In fact, they already are. Um, it, they may have already averted anything that's gonna feel like a crisis. It's gonna feel more like a bleed of the treasury because they moved to something called income-based um, repayment, which basically limits, allows people to sign up for a payment plan which limits the payments to a fraction of your disposable income, and then there's forgiveness after 10 or 20 years. And so if you, um, by the way, that's another example of a government program that could have been better constructed. Because at some point, um, if you borrow enough and you do the math, you realize you might as well borrow as much as you possibly can because there's no way under the rule for paying it back that you will ever pay it back. Um, so it, it, that, I'll say one good thing about the Trump budget. There's actually a proposal in there to restructure that program in a way that is more rational. But anyway, the Department of Education is worried about it, but they're more worried about students um, defaulting and they're looking for, for ways around it. I think it'll be a different kind of crisis. Okay, okay, good. Um, oh, I need, okay, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. <laughs>